What's up, storytellers? I'm Clark Rowlandson, the magic engineer, and this is another episode of Spells and Specialists, where we use stories and magic to teach technical topics and communicate science. And I didn't trip over the words this time. As always, I am joined by the eco-friendly Magus Lovis, and we also have, I mean, we always have a guest, but today we have, uh, we have Mauricio with us, who if you didn't, if you haven't listened to part one, go listen to oh part one. Oh my goodness, go listen to it. <laughs> Town of Fun, I think Lovis and I were having to work hard not to ask more questions. There were a couple points where I was about to talk, I'm like, no, 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 no let, let, let Mauricio go. <laughs> Let him keep talking. Uh, but yeah, Mauricio, thank you for being here. Can you give people a quick introduction in case they are ignoring all of our advice about listening to part one? <laughs> uh, well, hopefully uh, <clears throat> I don't have to re-meet any, or I'm, hopefully I'm re-meeting everyone and not meeting anyone for the first time because they've taken your advice and gone to listen to part one. <laughs> um, <laughs> they let me meander. So it's definitely fun. There's a lot that we talked about um, and covered. It was really cool. Um, my name is Mauricio Garcia. Um, I'm a perfumer based in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I make fragrances for my own brand or craft perfumery, but also for other brands and people. Um, I am also the co-founder of the Coalition of Sustainable Perfumery, um, which is kind of a group of industry makers that connect with experts. And we have video interviews with um, heads of sustainability for fragrance houses, ecologists, etc., where we can learn about how perfumery um, as an industry can become more sustainable. Excellent. We covered so much stuff. And in part so two, much stuff. this is where we are going to take a bunch of that and find our seed crystal for the magic system that we're going to build in part three. And this is going to be fascinating because we have so many directions we can go. I always like to start these by doing a kind of quick review of if there were any key ideas or phrases or terms that really leapt out to you. Uh, and I've got a I've got a huge list. I'm just gonna hit a couple of these. Um so and some of these are okay, I'm just gonna kind of go through a number of them. <laughs> One, I love the idea of the compound shifting our consciousnesses. Yeah. Uh, I also wrote down the thought of just the term notes, which I have heard that. But as we talked about the descriptors, my brain started going off in all kinds of directions about synesthesia and the connection yep. between the smells and potential magical effects and things like that. Because we say it's sharp. What if it was actually sharp? But that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole side thing. Um, the fact that we technically have two noses, um, I love. I just love the idea of mass spec and trying to bring that into some magical concepts and uh this is darker but it's me so nobody should be surprised <laughs> just when you said that people are kind of the final ingredient yeah i so... knew you were gonna do that <laughs> so perfect <laughs> in so many ways <laughs> especially if you wanted to do a horror story where people are like oh you mean like when they spray it on themselves oh no literally <laughs> the last ingredient <laughs> not a um, yeah, we don't have to go anywhere with that, but I thought it was fun. And I, I also like the idea of people's experiences changing their interaction with their sense and potentially with the magic. Um, so Lovis, what about you? What's some of the stuff that really stood out from part one? Yeah, I mean, the, the interaction with the people and their skin and their noses and everything was super fascinating to me um, because it would mean that However, the magic works, it means it works differently for everybody and that producing something comes with like a high degree of variability potentially um, with the effects that it has. And also that um, you were talking about the properties of the skin, like the acidity and that that can come from diet and, um, and our immune systems and things and how people might change their diet in order to react a certain way to a certain something that we create in the magic system um i thought that was really cool so yeah. i do which i do is, like the people focus part which is oddly reminiscent and a people reflection of our last magic system with max actually 
Yeah, because that it was is. about nutrition and stuff of the animals. That was about nutrition. But, yeah, yeah. That was we interviewed a vet and talked about pet health and nutrition. And uh -huh. anyway, you can yeah. listen to that episode in June. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was really cool. And then um, the all of the stuff you told us about where all the resources come from and that there are ethical issues and sustainability issues associated with where everything comes from and that you need a huge amount of biomass to be able to produce even a tiny amount of oil. Um, and that, of course, you know, from an ecological perspective, that, that of course it resonated with me, like nobody is surprised. So, um, yeah, those are, those are kind of the two things that, that really hooked, hooked into me. Okay. Uh, Mauricio, was there anything about the questions Lois and I were asking, or if there were specific things that were in your mind that you were very carefully trying to shunt away to prevent going too deep in the magic? <laughs> Now's your chance to spill a couple of those. Okay. All right. So that's real. Um, so there are, um, I um, really liked actually that you um, were a little, were more focused on kind of how how we interact with fragrance or the or the things that fragrances are made out of um and how we kind of experience and experience them as like embodied creatures that was kind of really what the orientation of your questions were which was fun um so i think i will bring in just a few little kind of extra things just to spice things up you know okay. throw around. um there are a few concepts um in perfumery that i think are really fun um, one is that, um, perfume and poison are very frequently associated together in our histories. Um, Catherine de Medici, who was the, the, like, kind of, she was like almost like the perf first perfume collector, the first like popular, uh, popular person that made, that spread the popularity of perfumery when she was, um, a child bride, uh, and moved from Fran Italy to France. Um, that's like a whole other story. But she uh, installed a court perfumer who was also also her court poisoner. Which, uh, that, oh, is, that is, that is so perfect. How did we not talk about this? Because, because. So, yeah, so there was like, yeah, there were a few things that I was just like, I'm not going to, but I'm glad that there's an opportunity for us to touch on them. Um, because, real quick, just so everybody understands why those, those are so associated, we talked a lot about extraction and concentration of these compounds and it is the dose that makes the poison so it makes perfect sense that when you go through all of this process to extract and condense you also end up with something that is potentially highly toxic and something that may be fine yeah. as a topical scent if you put it in somebody's food or in their drink might be completely different and we also talked about when we extract the compounds especially for essential oils that the way they act in the plant they can also interact with our immune systems and our internal systems and oh. everything and that they have effects on us and that's where a lot of medicinal and therapies and stuff come from but also um you talked about synthetically creating compounds without having the real ones so that you could have the smell but not the effect so for in terms of poisons you could very easily be like yeah i mean i smell it and then somebody has actually slipped the real compound in there that makes it poison. I love that, first of all. I love, <laughs> you, you know, mercurial trickster stuff is always really fun. But actually, um, the effects are similar, if if not the same. They aren't the same because um, for whatever reason, and I think there's a few few different reasons, but we won't really go into them because that's a whole other thing. Um, but um, whole essential oils do actually have a more effective therapeutic action than isolated molecules however those molecules do still lock into the different systems um in our bodies so like uh lameter's molecules with the central nervous system linalol or um the vanillin which is um the main odorant um of vanilla and flavor component of vanilla actually um interacts with our opium receptors um so that's yeah interesting so, yeah so okay. that's great. Um, and then there's like things like um, lily molecules. There's a really specific lily molecule um, that its trade name, the, what we refer to it in, or what we refer to it as in perfumery is borgenol, um, is actually uh, 
an attractant to human sperm they like freak out and like like jet to it when <laughs> okay okay i i have to i have to rein this back in a bit i'm sorry oh, I, do, I do want to hear more like, about uh, this that's like a thing too so like again this like the how we're more like plants than we are bacteria right in the sense of like our actual like beings but so that's kind of neat um and the poison thing um you can imagine how uh perfume was roped into the witchcraft laws um and the witchcraft phrases um people who knew how to work with plants to prepare consciousness altering whether it's euphoria from a good smell or death from a plant or from you know some alkaloids from henbane um it's the same knowledge um it's certainly the same world um yeah in the modern age tend to forget that but for me it's a very fascinating aspect um and then the other one just again to not throw too many things um is that um it's fragrances as magical constructs um and so like um there is there are concepts in magic where the like object is the spell and the spell is the object um so potentially like familiar construction out of things that are made out of smells or talismanic constructions made out of smells um so that's also you know a little well from which you can dip okay okay uh all right so lots of fun stuff there already and i think you can see why we had to um bring ourselves back in in part <laughs> one um, yeah also perfume and poison that's the title of a book <laughs> well it's Just actually saying. a few different ones but you so you should definitely you guys should definitely look into a few uh horror movies as well that are oriented <laughs> towards people perfumery <laughs> if you can oh. send yeah we'll, yeah we'll get into that we definitely want links for that i know there's oh, yeah. there's I'm one book to... that is just like mm-hmm. perfume but i am thinking of just a yeah, title a of like the poison in the perfume or just anyway uh, i love this book it was a gift. It was gifted to me by my mentor. It's um, the chemistry of plants, perfumes, pigments, and poisons. Yeah. So you want to, you know, if you, all the technical stuff that, you know, the deep little diving parts, check that book out. I'm, I'll send you guys all the information. Yes. yes. It's wonderful. And okay. we'll put it in the show notes. Right. Go, no, Clark. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have to, we, we need to pull back from the technical side a little bit. And I need <laughs> to learn a little bit about you and your interactions with stories. So when first off what type of medium do you generally consume stories through is it games comic books graphic novels books audio books what's what's your main book. format books and also um movies are a series but generally i um i'm a kind of a book person in a story there's kind of six major elements and everybody's familiar with most of them right you have character plot setting theme genre elements and then the last one, because it's me, is magic systems, right? You have your magic, which is the element you add it. Doesn't exist in every story, uh, but most genre fiction does. The magic is that element of the fantastical. So we have these six areas. And if you were reading a story where each of them was graded uh, with letter grades, right? F through A. And all of them were a C, except one which one would you want to be the A? Like, which one, if it was an A, you would overlook all the Cs and still enjoy the story? Plot. Plot. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. We've not had a plot answer yet. I don't think. I, I'm, I, uh, not, I'm not snobbish with what I like to read, but I do have my authors that I really love because of how good they are at storytelling. Um, and I'm like way more likely to like hop on something new from someone that I really like because I like the way that they write, um, then potentially pick something like new up, um, that is kind of vague. So give me a couple names, a really beautiful plot can, can fill in, can, you know, make me ignore other things sometimes. Okay. Uh, give me a couple of names of authors. I really love Patricia McKillop. Um, I adore Patricia McKillop actually. Um, I also really like Peter S. Beagle, uh, Robin McKinley. I really enjoy Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, the Queen. Uh, okay. Uh, um, I really like. Uh, oh, I'm all actually all kind of awful with names, to be completely honest. Um, she wrote um, the Song of Achilles um, and Circe. Oh. 
Okay. Um, okay. I really don't want. Is it Miller? Um, That's okay. This is giving us kind of a, an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah. And as a, as a side note, you should definitely check if you haven't read any of his stuff. You should definitely check out Robert McCammon. And I can send you more information about that. Um, it was one of the stories that at the end, I was I, I finished Swan Song, and I was bawling. And I went up to my wife. She's like, "Is everything okay?" I said, "Yeah, it's just a really good book." <laughs> That's over. It's the, the worst. Time. It's been book the ending, over. the ending was just great. I'm like, everybody got what they deserved, and it's not it's not like happy, but I'm very satisfied. When you said you like the beautiful plot, that's what it made me think of. Okay, so. You like to, you you really like the plot. Okay, so in your stories with magic systems, is there a flavor of magic system you really prefer? Do you really prefer um, monsters? Do you prefer kind of nebulous esoteric stuff? Do you like tech? Do you like magic tech? Uh, I think you already answered this, but I want to ask it again. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I really like. Um, I really like. Uh, kind of animistic magic systems in this where like things are like alive for characters to interact with um where it's like there are more like humans aren't the only thing that like has a kind of a role in the plot i always find that kind of in an interesting element um and so with perfume there's kind of that there's totally a like way to attract you know um an air spirit or whatever right like there's or a monster um, or to like construct a monster. Um, so I also, I kind of like, um, I like, uh, so like in that magical world, like um, as an example of a book, The Last Unicorn was probably like one of my most formative uh, books when I was growing up. Um, and certainly also films, which I watched first, um, which is really, really, really dark. <laughs> like when you really think about it. But so like this kind of darker, magical creatures interacting with humans and humans not necessarily being entirely um certain of like where they like what their role in that world is i think is kind of makes fertile ground for storytelling um i also really enjoy um i do enjoy like some of the darker kind of stories like um uh, where magic is a little more maybe maybe kind of taboo um or it's um something that it's like maybe everyone maybe most people have magic or exist in magic but there's like a proclivity towards a different maybe like a, a penchant for the poisonous shade plants like the nightshade mm -hmm. plant to like healing animals or something you know like that's kind of always interesting because then there's like then there's all the drama about like people responding to the character because of what their magic is, as opposed to just like responding to the character as the character is. So there's like also potential for storytelling in that. Um, but yeah, I kind of like the magical realism that is also like modern magical realism. I really love as well. And then the magical realism in the kind of like, you know, how we, how we tend to throw people into the past a little bit in order to make stuff a little more flexible. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we haven't had somebody with a plot before, so we're going to approach cool. this from a different angle because we probably could dive straight into the magic and get, and yeah, get some stuff out I of that. Not. But I, uh, this is something I've been experimenting with on this show is trying to come at it from... Because everybody approaches their stories from a different angle. And yeah. I am very much magic first, which is why I can do things the way I do and it doesn't work for everybody else. Uh, it's sounding to me like you were prob. It sounds like you were plot first, and then probably magic second, just from the people that the authors you're talking about and the type of stories that you're talking about with theme, maybe battling for second and third. But that's not relevant. <laughs> so, with that, all first. <laughs> let's let's start let's start talking about a interesting plot. What is a what is a plot arc that you either really enjoy or would really like to see or something that you think would help tell some of these stories from these takeaways that you have which I completely glossed over the takeaways but that is do we do that in this part I don't even remember it's fine I don't ah. think we have to in this part so yeah like what what kind of what kind of 
plots could we tell? Yeah. You want, do you want some examples or are you ready? I would love for you guys to, yeah. And then, because I there's some things coming together, but then let's see how they like either fuse together or differentiate. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if, if, if I hear plot arcs or plot archetypes, then I think, well, some examples would be a heist or like a tournament or um, you could talk coming of age story. You can talk kind of those the uh-huh. going on a quest, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Um, so those are some of the ones that I that come to mind. Yeah. And we're kind of doing some of the work from part four right now, but that's totally OK. Like some other things that I would be thinking of is do you want it to be a kind of conflict where something has gone wrong and somebody is trying to reestablish the status quo and then starts to uncover problems related to it, has to solve this big mess in order to move forward? Is it something that is being imposed on them and they then have to expose themselves into this world of information in order to thrive and survive? Or do you do you want something where it's them coming in for the first time or they're already in and it's much deeper and it's darker or it's being taken in a direction that they didn't anticipate or know about like I I'm just all... bound stuff off <laughs> being it I like all mall I like mall I like all the options um I really do so a quest is always fun and I feel like a great opportunity to have kind of a a large-ish fleshed out world but then like since we since it's a quest we the reader doesn't necessarily or the or the consumer doesn't necessarily expect it to be the whole story of the world but then also there's potential to tell other stories within the world so i and so i feel like plots um a good plot can not too stressfully be created with a quest type story um i also do really like the um story types where people are kind of like underground and maybe there's like an oppressive element to the society or or um I, I do really like kind of a revolutionary type stories as well. Um, so it could be fun for um, for the disruption of the status quo to be the goal because then the characters could be also a little, maybe a little um, more like edgy or rough around the edges or something. So that could be fun to explore. Um, uh, but so also I really do like... Um, I like a good coming of coming of age story as well, um, which is a little a little more people oriented and how they are relating to maybe the magic within themselves or their societies or how you know they're developing their their I guess their way of being is always kind of fun to see how um, authors weave those types of stories together. Okay, okay. Then so also here's, some really shady. So here's here's what I jotted down because uh, a lot of times it's just me processing what people are saying and trying to consolidate it. It, it sounds like um, what would be perfect would in what would be perfect would be a coming of age story where a character ends up going on a quest to achieve a very specific goal but on the way has to navigate uh, previously unencountered misconceptions and taboos and their discovery and completion of their quest takes an odd turn which will change. Uh, we'll change the status quo. Yes. Okay. A, that sounds really cool. Part four is going to be a breeze. Well, <laughs> well that means we're going to have more time to get into some of the specifics, right? Yeah. Which we don't always do. So since we have that structure, um, we'll be able to do that. So with that, let's now start talking about what kind of magic system would enable that story. So this is where we can just start dumping out ideas of things we think would be cool, stuff we would like to work, and we're going to kind of just freeform it for a little while, and then it will start to coalesce. We'll, we'll try and narrow the stuff down into a single very potent sentence. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I want to hear what, I, I definitely want to hear uh, what has taken root, you know, to use one of my, my favorite types of uh, things. <laughs> uh, in, in your imagination I mean as soon as as soon as I heard quest um I and because we were talking about poisons there's the kind of 
the first thing that pops into my head is the antidote to a poison. And you have to go on a quest to find a particular plant that is the antidote to a poison. Um, so that's kind of, that was the first idea. And it, it's probably the most, it's it's not the most original idea, but it was the first idea that came into my head. Um, and so, yeah, a quest, a quest for a particular plant um, to produce a particular perfume. Okay. So we had talked about magical constructions and a lot of times I feel that magic is just taking our concepts and making them bigger, uh, making them bigger or making them more tangible, especially when we're dealing with fiction. Um, so I love that idea of an antidote. Um, I'm almost kind of picturing something where they need to create a uh, I don't know what the adjective for antidote would be. An anti, antidotical. <laughs> they, they need to create a perfume that is an antidote. Because um, maybe it's a situation where the environment has changed or a particular person is having an odd reaction and they need to create a perfume that they can wear which will act as an antidote for them or potentially the group of people or even <laughs> an entire building. Um yeah, what if the distribution of the antidote has to be um, volatile because it needs to be spread? Yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, so one of the things that came to mind when you um, when you mentioned the antidotal herbs, like the quest for the antidote, was actually the moly herb. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with um, that kind of mythological plant from the Odyssey that um, Hermes, Mercury provided... Yeah. Yeah, Odysseus to cure um, him from Circe's spells or from, I think it was Circe's spells, mm -hmm. uh, which is spells. And um, it's uh, actually recent research has suggested that it might be um, lily or lily of the valley because the compounds in the root of lily of the valley actually are cures for the alkaloids that um, make up the poisons of the Solanaceae or witches' herbs, the nightshades, henbane, monkshood, aconite, um, which is which is the same thing. Um, all those like famous poisonous herbs, belladonna, um, datura. So the comp so it's a potentially that lily of the valley is the moly herb. Um, but lily of the valley is actually poisonous and we can't extract um the aromatic compounds from it. We can only reconstruct the smell of it using things like the GCMS. Um so that also may be like potentially uh, useful where maybe there's like some kind of like something that's been given to people or like been distributed to the populace without them knowing and like our protagonist does know or something. <laughs> okay. So there's a group of people that do know. And so maybe again, that's like where we can bring in that like kind of underground quality. And so they need to find this this herb like will lose this plant what is this plant that they need to yeah. find yeah um, we and can't, this is... uh, yeah because then we can take parts we can like remake whatever part of it that we need in order to like have this volatile distribution of it or yeah. maybe the perfume is like if we're doing something a little magical then like maybe the perfume is like some thing like maybe it's like a way to like I don't know, maybe it gains its own sentience or something. Who knows? With this crazy holy herb or whatever. Okay, yeah. And th this one is tricky for me because this is like the exact opposite of the direction I usually go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what I have found when people, when we want to start with the plot, it's very helpful to start thinking of these points and really focusing like what role can the magic play in it? We've already tackled one, right? We, the, we have, we are connecting the the quest itself, the main goal to the magic, creating some kind of antidote, which also means we have room to play for whether we want the poison itself to be related to the magic system or not. Um, what other kinds of ways, if we have this, uh, this young person going through the coming of age and discovering themselves, what kinds of other situations or discoveries might we be able to bring the magic in. so on the on the quest if we want to also bring in what we talked about 
about the ethical issues and sustainability issues. And if we're talking about an oppressive, if they want to to see, oh, well, the system is quite oppressive and I and I want to do something to change it. Um, the way that it's produced, the way that the um, mass market resources are produced on their way, they can, they might see a different side of the industry and that, you know, the, the resources and how they're being sent will bring in the magic system because that's what's being used to produce the, yeah. the perfumes. Yeah. What is the way, and again, like to refer to episode one, since people should go watch episode one, the, um, the way that they're the, the space or the place or just the energy of the the concept behind their production influences the end end result. So like if the um if the production is yeah. really extractive and exploitive and like kind of evil, then like maybe what's distributed to people without them knowing is like this yeah. and like they're like that would totally a- allow like there to be like it's not just like the protagonist that has like the perfume magic, but maybe this like type of magic is more actually kind of prevalent. And it's like maybe too spread out and people are too affected by like, I don't know, like spells or spirits of like disease or something that may, that is advantageous for an antagonist, right? Or an antagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it, I love I think, that. You know, so, like there's a lot of potential. Yeah. The the like the like evil or the bad the the malef- the malefica or whatever to be distributed to people and this is like something that like then the um, protagonist is like realizing is happening and maybe other okay. people are like blind or just turned yeah just paying attention yeah. well, so and then it- as soon as they know it has a different effect because their experience and their knowledge might change the effect of it so if we're talking it- about a coming of age story then. It may be the protagonist's magic, the, what he, what they have been using doesn't work anymore. And they have to like readjust the, the perfumes or the magic based off of who they are becoming. So yeah. here's, here's another thing that kind of ties in is maybe, so they've been sent off for an antidote for this problem. Um, and maybe the antidote isn't actually a thing. What they have been sent off is a treatment for the symptoms and the actual cure is addressing the process that's real so like they discover all of this stuff and while they're on their quest and that can be part of the internal growth right of being like look yeah i have this thing and it's going to make you feel better but that's not the full solution and that can be part of how their discovery and their solution actually ends up changing everything um because especially yeah. if they tie it and we talked about perfumes carrying messages, if they distribute this antidote and this antidote also carries with it kind of a hidden perception, which then opens them up and like with, with dark ways we could go with that in terms of mass manipulation and mind control, but here it's a positive way of like changing people's perception. So then they can smell, basically they could smell and experience the taint and will want to change the process. Well. It might also be the thing that was causing the, like the solution is almost the same thing that was causing the problem in the first place, right? If you think about things like, we perceive a certain piece of information based off of other knowledge that we have. So we, you know, if we're, if we're exploring this idea of an impressive government, that would be, that would be one way where they, everything that we tell you is good because we're just, you have this, you have this, um, you're perceiving the this magic or or the magic itself is making you perceive in a certain way. Well, there's a constant cloud over your mind from Constantly. Like, yeah. There. They literally yeah. fill a town with mind fog to keep people complacent. And yeah. the antidote, they could I mean, this coming of age person could be what part if, of the government and they've realized somebody is cottoned on and that, he's being sent. I would, I was, yeah. One of the uh, thing that kind of came to mind was maybe what if um, they were like because very frequently in um, in in this world, um, uh, old for the old fragrance houses, children will inherit their like fathers like some there there are like multi generations of perfumers, 
um, very much so, especially in the old world. Um, and so maybe the like, maybe this young person's parent is involved with the government and like their whole, like their lineage is like, has always been this lineage of figurant magic or something. Um, but the son is like, or maybe the father like just disappears and he had just discovered like what they were doing and he told his son. And so now the son is not entirely, maybe, like, maybe there is like hormonal changes that happen. And so like aromatic qualities and magical qualities shift. And that is like something that he's going through. So that could be like kind of a, a little bit of a plot, like, you know, some kind of a challenging aspect of the plot where his magic doesn't work a hundred percent correctly because he's going through his, his changes. Um, but at the same time, he does have the information necessary to potentially create this cure. And again, then this is like where in the journey, during the journey, all these other things are revealed. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where I was kind of like, what if he was aware of it so that he can use the magic and that can be a part of the story. Um, but like there is that like connection to like the dark organization. Yeah. I, the the mind control fog though was like I feel like that kind of was like kind of a bit of a click like I was like oh that could be okay so wow. we 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 have a we have a flare of of interest for mind oh, control yes. fog like the, I don't know that was when as soon as you described it in that way I was like oh yeah because like like uh, imagine the potentiality behind that well so there actually um, is a precedent for a kind of a mind control. Uh, I mean, in stories, but if our olfactory neurons and bulb directly influence these like really ancient parts of our brains, um, you know, that's not as it's, it's it, as you said, we can help we magic can be what like bridges the gap in, in our knowledge and far as far as what the me actual mechanics are. But I mean, we do know that there's like quantum tunneling between energy states and that's part of how we interpret sense so there's it's an, um it's not as though there isn't uh, we don't have the mechanics in there that would allow an outside agent to influence sex is the film you were thinking of the the black widow is origin because um i watched that and they had they had this mind control fog was it. and she was to it. sever the olfactory nerve in order to break I See, the I wouldn't be paying attention to that part. Whoa. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, no, no, I, told you I, reading, I told you I was reading it and I was like, I just I just had a flash of her in her white suit with her red hair and doing flips. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's that. So, okay. Greener. A... Oh, that's so crazy. Uh, <laughs> control them because they couldn't hurt him. His smell. I remember yeah. like there. So I was like, we don't Actually, so I think I've got something for us to start with now. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a quick side side tangent. I've I've been trying. I've been learning more about uh, about coaching and that kind of stuff because I do freelance coaching for writers. And yes, one true. of the things people talk is like, "Oh, you want to guide them to their own solutions." I'm really bad at that. Uh, generally, what I do is I listen to what people say and then I try and consolidate it and be like, "Here's what I'm hearing and what you're saying. Um, is this actually what you mean and what you want?" Uh, so that's what, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it, it's, it's what I do and that's what I'm doing here. So from what we've been talking about. And not just like throwing too many waves at you of ideas. No, things. cause, cause check this out. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to read the seed crystal and then we're going to work on, we're going to see if it's hitting and if it's not, we'll keep talking. If it is, we'll work on refining it. So magically infused perfumes can gently alter people's minds and bodies as well as aspects of reality. So cool. Really? Like that. Should because I? It's like it totally, yeah. That's, I mean, it's magical, right? And it's, and it also leaves the door open to so much potential. Mm -hmm. like, almost not, there's almost nothing you can't do with it in a way. Yep. Uh, and, yeah. And we They're... get to determine what that magical infusion process looks like, which even if multiple people wanted to take this seed crystal, they could go in extremely different directions of what that infusion looks like, of any of the limits and the fashion and how. Uh, I didn't know if we would want the term gently, but I liked the idea of sort of that enveloping thing where it's not always 
instantaneous. That's, that's, there's very, there's very well, few. Yeah. Ex- yeah, there's very few if, exceptions where gentle, odors are like then it's, instant effects. Yeah, because if it's gentle, then it's that like frog in the hot water, right? You might not even realize that it's happening to you, which well, is well, faction actually is very fast. So we have to be able to we have to be able to interpret a scent um, quickly. But I do I do like the version of gentle that's like subtle where it's like they don't know it's happening. Yes. Yeah. I didn't. I yeah. I, I I thought saying slow, but I'm like no, it's not slow. It's very fast, but it's like a pressure that very quickly builds. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that is like gently redirecting your course. Like if you've ever been walking in the woods or walking in nature and you start to catch a whiff of something rotten and you just sort of steer away, um, you pick up on it instantly and the, it doesn't force you to do things. The pressure on your behavior and your future actions, the pressure itself is gentle. Um, but it's there. Right. So I, I love that. that. Is that sparking more ideas in terms of things we could do, different magical effects, different yeah, ways that they actually, could use this? You know, when we were first talking about um, like themes or or like types of stories, magical technology didn't was, I mean, I kind of was like, okay, well, like we use technology to manufacture the compounds, but in terms of like the actual magic being a part of the technology, it wasn't really necessarily something that sparked, but like, I do think that it's very interesting that there could be this like old world, old perfumery, right? Like the kind of, you know, the old, what we talking about, like folk perfumery and extractions and such. And then like this more advanced form of the magic because they don't like menthols, menthols, menthol, whether mm-hmm. it comes from mint or it comes from the petroleum or it comes from algae. Um, the structure is the same. And um, while there is an argument to be made that um, there are bits of other compounds that are always a part of the extraction that change the way the scent smells. I think that's something that can easily be incorporated into the magic. And something that we run into in our world, especially when we start trying to do synthetic duplications of compounds, is when we don't understand the function of things that seem to be extraneous. Yeah, You may have a compound that is really big and we're like, oh, this is the part we need for the odor, and you lop all of the extra off, not understanding that that piece is what keeps it from entering our bloodstream and affecting our brain. Well, like there can be stuff like that. So yeah. industry is missing those pieces where it's like, no, you need, we still need this for it to be gentle. Um, and the other thing that kind of popped in my head, I was really, was really fixating on, I was trying to rein myself in and really try and focus on the magical realism and the fragrance as constructs for you. Uh, well, actually, right now something just came into my mind. So I'm I, tell me, tell me what you're thinking. So what I was thinking is actually creating uh, basically drone clouds, cloud servitors, where they can create these little um, little clouds of stuff that can impart amounts of force and do kind of repetitive tasks. So I was thinking of that being kind of an industry because then that spirals because they have to do a whole bunch of production and biomass in order to create their servants in order for their servants to go ahead and create the other stuff that they're actually selling, which in some ways it will be cheaper because you don't have to pay and care for people. But in terms of impact and the ripple effect and the connection to the rest of the world, it's going to be much, much bigger. Whoa, that's really cool. So in that thread or in that vein, um, on, um, in speaking of servitors, um, I was kind of thinking about whether maybe um, additional like non-human characters or, you know, how I kind of mentioned that. What if our, um, it's possible to have relationships with specific like plants or something through these, com- through these aromatic, like they become aromatic familiars or they, they, and they can actually like communicate maybe with the protagonist, maybe not with everyone, but with certain people. Cause then it's like, he has his like set of allies or they have their set of allies that they are working with and they're like nature kind of spirits in their way. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. Also then we can develop like, it's like almost like the magical system is like, so like there's such a, just the potentiality that means there's different ways of do of working the magic. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, yeah. Now I, I really like that because there's kind of the whole like canary in the coal mine type thing, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you can do that in other routes. 
where it's something somebody is a specialist in a certain type of perfume because that they have developed a relationship with the lily. Yeah. How and cool. so they bring it with them and it's able to communicate and help them. And it has senses they don't, right? So it's able yeah. to be like, oh, no, nope, there's too much of this. You need to tweak it this way and stuff like that. Or even around. And Sorry, Lois, go. Cool. No, no, go. Go for it. Go for it. No, no, no. It was really just that, like, um, for formulation, but also like environment, right? Like, mm-hmm. with like, you know, a protective, maybe certain types of smells are more protective than others and they'll warn you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was just thinking like if you're in that industry and you have your aromatic familiar, like you're, you make perfumes out of the lily because that's your familiar, the quest can kind of be dual, right? Maybe this protagonist doesn't have their familiar yet. Um, and on the quest, he's maybe looking for the antidote, but on the quest, they find their familiar. Maybe it is the antidote. Well, I like that a lot. I, just, I thought how funny would it be if their familiar ends up being a buzzard <laughs> because buzzards, buzzard ha- they have incredible sense of smell Ew, they really do so oh. especially if it like that would be the canary like on steroids of being able to walk into a situation and then instantly tell them to like hey i'm detecting notes of these things we need to proceed with caution that's super interesting you know? I was thinking like a plant familiar, but that's, oh, and you came out but, with buzzard. I was like, then, wait. Yeah. <laughs> what if there's like certain people have like more like scent oriented familiars, like mice and dogs and things. Uh, interestingly enough, there are um, maybe it's like people have them because like we actually have more part. So while dogs and mice have more receptors than we do in terms of olfaction there are more parts of our brain geared towards interpretation than there so like the creation of these associations there's pieces of us that are geared towards that um i so, the buzzard though is so wild because it is you know mythologically it is this like harbinger of of destruction but also like regeneration and like in Mesoamerican culture, at least the um, the vulture is second to the eagle, but nothing uh-huh. flies higher than the eagle. And so, like the vulture is like this, like you know, rainbow-headed, crowned yeah. king, like and, it, and yeah, yeah. And, and I just looked it up. So there is a special uh, there is a special oil that birds have on their feathers, green mm-hmm. oil. So it might be that that ends up being her specialization. Like if people specialize in like I was reading about that yesterday, yeah, just they'll. Read randomly reading about that yesterday yeah, yeah. <laughs> so some people will be like i specialize with lanolin i specialize with like animal fat type stuff and like because you have the oh, that could be the link could be the oils in well, look, look. fibers or in um in on on yeah. that animals produce as well because part of the reason it's useful is it uh it is in the feathers it apparently enhances the flexibility and the waterproof nature of it mm-hmm. so like that there's a whole bunch of stuff that could help them guide in the direction they want to take their life and shape of their personality and, and all kinds of stuff. And then there's all these things of sen- sense as um, communication. Like I'm just now imagining a thing where they they have to craft a special they have to craft a special preen oil to groom their buzzard with so that they can communicate with it. Or then it reacts with the buzzard and they're able to interpret the sense and the changes. Okay. What if this magical buzzard actually can produce almost like what its what its partner, its human partner, like I don't know, like they have to know how to do it, but these like a plant familiar will do it in the way that like a plant will, and yeah. a bird familiar will do it in this like oil, and so like there's also the potential for like the familiar to like fly and spread this like scent, right? Yeah, Just lots of routes we could go. Yeah, whoa. So- you could- you could also split it between somebody who's producing the perfume, but like like you were talking about noses, right? So maybe the nose of the industry has like an animal familiar that perceives the yeah. scent, and then yeah. other people have plant familiars that produce two noses. It. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, two, two noses. noses. Exactly. There are two noses. Uh, and it it could turn into this whole thing where like as a perfumer, it's frowned down on because once you have Basically, when you get a familiar like that, you're becoming much more specialized, so you can't cover as broad a range and stuff like that. So 
interesting things where they're starting to limit themselves. But okay, so but with, then people with that, work together so that you have more than one type of plant in a in a perfume, right? Right, right. And then like so, I'm I, I think this has answered the question that it is sparking ideas. It's giving us lots and lots <laughs> of ideas and crazy directions we could go and how interesting and interconnected this world is going to be. Uh, so I'm I think. We have nailed the seed crystal. I'm going to read it one more time and see if there's anything we want to tweak. So, magically infused perfumes can gently alter... I'm going to change from people to creatures. Uh, can gently alter creatures, minds, and bodies, as well as aspects of reality. Super cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, cool. We did it. That's that's the seed crystal. <laughs> uh, lots of stuff we can go with. And in the next part, we are going to look at the magic system blueprint and start talking about yeah. more things. And that's going to let us get more into the world building. Um, but uh, I think th I'm very pleased with how that worked of starting with the plot and sort of walking backwards. Yeah. That was, it's uh, going to be new as well once we get to part four because we've kind of like... We have the bones of the plot, right? And so it'll it'll also affect how we, you know, we haven't we haven't really done part four when we already have the bones of the story. This can be super it's interesting. More colorful and more just like we'll get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm awesome. excited. I'm very, yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah, this is super so, cool. Um, uh, Mauricio, where can people find you? Do you want them to find you? Yeah, totally. If um, so you can, if you want to, I mean, if just first and foremost, if anyone wants to reach out, has questions about perfume or wants um, resources, I'm definitely going to provide you all with a, a, maybe a list of some interesting books um, that could be fun to read. Um, but any kind of specific questions, people can reach me at Mauricio, M-A-U-R-I-C-I-O at herbcraftperfumery.com. Um, so I'll just go ahead and give you my email. Um, similarly, that is my website, herbcraftperfumery.com. Um, I'm at herbcraft.perfumery on Instagram, as well as at Petaled Serpent. Um, that's my oh, nice. that's my forward-facing me account, which is um, a little more, it's a less like kind of like perfume branding stuff and more um, kind of like broader industry things. I talk a lot about a lot of different things. Um, and sometimes I just post, post cool pictures that I think are neat. So, um, whatever is more convenient, people are totally welcome to reach uh, out to me through both. And then one more time, if you're into learning about the sustainability stuff, which could be useful for our next episode, uh, sustainableperfumery.org is where that is. Awesome. I'm totally picturing like the other nose of someone is, is a snake with their like, this is the tongue. way they scent yeah, yeah. with the tongue. Really, yeah. They have yeah. really we're gonna put a a petaled serpent into well, our story. Yeah, and you <laughs> said petaled serpent, and I was like, we didn't even talk about magical creatures. Like no, that's always we're a conversation gonna. to have. Is whether <laughs> I was avoiding that simply like for more magical realism, so it's skirting that line of like how much is fabrication, how much isn't. But uh, anyway, yeah. So this this is great. Um, great. Thank you so much for joining great. us, Mauricio, and thank you everybody for watching. And come back to the magic engineer for part three where we dig into the magic system blueprint all yeah. right now again i i yeah it's great so <laughs> please come back and see what we do with it but whatever you do make sure that you keep writing and stay awesome